word for our children's message. question for you. Do you know how many candles there are with us right now in this room? How many? How many? Take a look. Do you know what a candle is supposed to do? It's supposed to light up the room. I have an idea. You know what could be fun? What if we turned off all the lights in the room and saw bright the eye? Should we try it? Okay, let's ask the sound guy if he could turn the lights off. Oh, man. Those lights are doing their job, aren't they? Wow. Okay, we can turn the lights back up. Now, this, this right over here is a special candle holder. How many candles over here? It's one that's lit, and then two, and three, and four, and five. This one is going to get brighter and brighter and brighter, and it'll get brightest on Christmas Eve when Jesus comes. He's the light of the world. Now, when we turned the lights off, you couldn't see as well, could you? Nope. But with the lights on, you can see just fine. Well, Jesus said, I am the light. And you can see, <laughs> what can we see with Jesus? We can see God. We can see how much he loves us. We can see the truth. We can see how much hmm, we are to... So Jesus says, you're the light too, and we're going to shine in the world. And the more candles there are, the more, oh, it's brighter, isn't it? So let's talk to Jesus about that. Let's fold our hands. Can, can everybody fold your hands? All right, here we go. We're going to pray. You pray after me. Dear Jesus, you are the light of the world. Help me to shine so everyone can see you. Amen. Hey guys, thanks for coming up. Please stand as we sing the Alleluia in verse. gospel according to St. Matthew, the 24th chapter. Jesus said, but concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. As were the days of Noah, so will it be coming, the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark, and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away, so will it be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding at the meal, mill. One will be taken and one left. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. This is the gospel of our Lord.
Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. So I just started a new TV series on Netflix uh, called Ancient Apocalypse. Anybody heard of this one yet? Oh, well, a handful of you. Okay, awesome. Well, uh, as I mentioned a couple weeks ago, it seems the frequency of shows like this with an apocalyptic end of the world theme seem to be increasing uh, lately. And I don't know, I'm just attracted to it for some reason, Doomsday Preppers. This is my jam. Like, this is my stuff. Maybe it is for you too. Um, but in this show, the premise is that uh, around 11,000 years ago, there was this cataclysmic event that involved flooding and heavy rainfall that totally decimated the world, wiped out civilizations, wiped out nearly the entire human population. I know, shocking, right? New discovery. Well, their theory is that uh, a meteor field, an asteroid field, uh, that comes in contact with the Earth pretty regularly, came a little too close this 11,000 years ago, hit the polar ice caps, caused cascading you know, glacier melt from the polar ice caps, and this is what carved out a bunch of the big ravines and canyons that we see in our world today, a lot of flooding, a lot of rain. And their theory is that uh, what previous you know, historians, mainstream historians and archaeologists say, um, civilizations and structures that they built three to 5,000 years ago, these guys are saying, Graham Hancock here is saying that um, these civilizations were much older and were kind of these, these buildings were reappropriated by like the Egyptians in say the third century BC. But really they were much older structures and a lot of them are underwater and they, they go through the show and they, you know, explore these underwater um, human remains of buildings and stuff. And their warning for us today is that this could happen again. Right? So if we don't do something, it's going to happen again. Well, I know uh, some of you hear this story of a flood uh, you know, some thousands of years ago, and you're like, yep, I heard that one before, right? You know, we read that in the Bible. And a lot of ancient uh, cultures uh, have this story of a flood. Um, and what's interesting is that uh, archaeology and science keeps on confirming stuff that's in the Bible. And I love it. I love it when this happens. Um, God's word is, is truth. And Jesus mentions this cataclysmic event that happened in our gospel text today when he talks about his second coming. Um, we are now in the season of Advent where we uh, remember Jesus' first Advent, of course, at Christmas time, but also his second Advent or his second coming. And here's what Jesus has to say. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. So, uh, what, did we, what do we know about the days of Noah? Well, we do know that thousands of years had passed uh, since the creation of the world. We know that after Cain killed Abel, God cursed Cain, and he was the builder of, one of, the, or builder of the first city. And he named it after his son Enoch. So there was civilization, uh, pretty advanced, you know, building cities already uh, right there with Cain. We also read in the Bible that uh, one of Cain's descendants, uh, Tubal-Cain, was a worker uh, of bronze and iron, uh, created instruments out of iron and bronze. So this all happened before the flood, um, before the days of Noah. Then we also read in Genesis chapter 6, right before the flood narrative, that uh, the sons of God married the daughters of men and created this race of people called the Nephilim. Anybody heard of the Nephilim before? Yeah, a few of you probably nerd out on that one. It's super interesting. You know, who are the Nephilim? I'm going to avoid going down the rabbit hole of, you know, all the theories about the Nephilim. And just stick with what the text tells us. And that's, uh, they were this uh, race of nobility, essentially, uh, first nobility. And uh, they ruled as tyrants. And yet they were admired by the people. Uh, that's what we know about these Nephilim. And so it's not crazy to think that these people uh, before Noah uh, created some pretty advanced civilizations, um, probably more so than we really give them credit for. And it isn't crazy to think that they got so enamored with themselves, with their achievements and their progress, that they thought themselves to be gods. We know, of course, this happened after the flood, right? 
with the Tower of Babel debacle. And it's not uh, crazy to think that, you know, sort of a cataclysm could happen today. With all of our um, technological advancements, though, we've been getting pretty high on ourselves. And one may wonder, maybe it's time for God to give us another piece of humble pie. Take us down, you know, a few notches. He did promise not to send another flood, though, right? But catastrophes come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. So, what do we know for sure in the days of Noah? Well, we know things got pretty bad. That's what we do know. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of his heart was only evil continually. It, it doesn't get much worse than that, right? <laughs> every intention of his heart was evil continually. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and the earth was filled with violence. I mean, that's a pretty bleak picture of mankind. God's beloved human creatures created in his image rejected him, gave themselves over to sin, to idolatry, to lust, to greed, envy, the thirst for power and control over other humans. Everybody, except for this one guy, Noah. Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. And we get this in the Old Testament quite a bit, this walking with God. Uh, uh, what does this mean, right? Well, I have a feeling it has a lot to do with a, a, a humble, dependent faith upon God, a, a, a fear of God, a trust in God. And Noah feared God and trusted him, and God prepared him for what was about to take place. And Noah listened. God gave him instructions, gave him some insight, some knowledge, some wisdom, and Noah listened to God. No doubt, Noah felt a little lonely at this time, uh, being the only man, right? Um, and perhaps he was ridiculed and mocked by his neighbors and friends, perhaps. Like, no, what in the world are you doing? You, you're crazier than a loon. Building a boat? The ocean's miles away. What are you doing? I doubt that thing can even float. It's so huge. Yeah, I'm sure it's tough for Noah. Perhaps you've felt lonely in your walk with Christ from time to time. Perhaps you've been mocked or questioned for your faith, for your prayers, for the time and money and energy that you spend on the things of God. Maybe you've been ridiculed for that or your belief in the tales of this ancient book. Or perhaps you've been mocked for your belief that Judgment Day is indeed coming and that everyone ought to repent and believe the good news or suffer the consequences. Well, Noah was vindicated for his actions. He was faithful, and the floodwaters came. And everybody was just carrying on as normal, eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, which are nothing wrong with these things, but they, they did them without any regard for God, without listening to him or fearing him. And they were all swept away. And it came all of a sudden. And Jesus says, so too will be the coming of the Son of Man. Jesus tells his disciples seven times in the Olivet Discourse, that's where we're at in Matthew here, that they will not know when he will return. And these words can seem a bit counterintuitive, okay? You will not know when the Son of Man returns. Jesus says, I don't know. The angels don't know. Only the Father in heaven knows. So don't try to predict it, okay? That's what Jesus is saying here. No one knows. And he meant it. And, but there, that doesn't stop people from guessing, right? We get plenty of this. I don't know if you've seen this meme lately or one like it. Donald Trump announces 2024 presidential run. Me frantically checking my dispy books. This is dispensationalism. Um, you can look that up later. Charts in the last verse of it as well to figure out which chapter of Revelation this puts us in. There's a lot of false teaching out there around the end times, okay? A lot of, and it's led to a lot of destructive stuff. And a lot of people make money off of it, writing books and then selling them. Don't buy them. Stop it. You can't predict it. 
Jesus says no one knows. No one knows. And the counterintuitive part about it is, is this. You might expect Jesus to say, don't worry about it. Since you don't know, don't worry about it. But instead, he says, keep watch. Be prepared. Get ready. Anticipate it. It's coming. It might come sooner. It might come later. But be ready. Trim the lamps. Get ready for his coming. So, if you have not been keeping watch for Jesus' coming, I have it on good authority, all authority in heaven and on earth, to start doing so now. Get ready. Keep watch. If you have been watching and you have grown weary, that's understandable. It's been 2,000 years since Jesus said these words, right? And you may think to yourself, uh, when Jesus says, I'm coming soon, certainly he would have come by now. If that's you, I have it on good authority to repent and keep watch for Jesus' is coming. I have two reasons to keep watch. Number one, because of where you are. Like me, you are here on earth. And it's filled with brokenness and incompleteness, sin, violence. This can be overwhelming, right? Keep watch because of where you are here on earth. We, sure, we have some beauty. Yes, we have goodness and truth. And God's light shines through, especially here in his church where he gives us his gifts, his word that sheds light on our lives and on his love for us. And he pours it out in the sacrament of the altar here and forgives us our sins. So there is good and beauty, but man, there's a lot of brokenness. There's lies, deceit, insults, and curses, betrayals, deception, direct character assassination. This happens even in God's church. And you've committed these things. There's sickness and death. We've seen all too much of it lately in our congregation. Grief and mourning. One believer is healed and another dies way too young. And the grief and the sorrow comes crashing in like waves crashing on a beach. The flood comes. Disaster strikes. So we must be prepared. We must keep watch. I'll tell you this. You or somebody you love, if it hasn't already happened, will develop a chronic illness that leads to death. That's a fact of life. So be prepared. Keep watch. Worst of all, our love for one another grows cold. And it's been happening for so long that we get used to it. That's the danger. We get used to sin. Now, I remember uh, one of the summer breaks during college, I went with my buddy up to northern Nebraska to work on his farm. He grew up on a farm in northern Nebraska, and and I had a blast. It was fun. It was interesting. It was hard work. Uh, I remember riding a four-wheeler and jumping off of it so I could tackle a calf so my buddy could come and tag it. That was very interesting. Uh, I rebuilt fences, uh, helped weld a corral together for the, for the cows, and uh, I also got uh, the opportunity to work with pigs. Anybody work with pigs? Yeah? Yeah, so I remember put, we had to put these pigs on a trailer, and so we, I came up to the pig barn, and I took a whiff. It was like a physical assault. Like, it almost knocked me out. It was... And I think my friend noticed my reaction. And he said, hey, Aaron, don't worry. You get used to the smell. <laughs> sure enough, he was right. I did get used to it. It didn't take very long. And it was okay. But it's not okay to get used to the smell in the world. It's not okay. When we go down into the muck and mire of human existence and bear with the sufferings of other people and love our neighbor. It brings a a godly fear, a deep sorrow, and a longing. How long, O Lord, must we wait? 
Come, Lord Jesus, quickly come. This is God's world, and it shouldn't smell like this, and we shouldn't get used to it. So, I have it on good authority. If you haven't been watching, keep watch now. Be ready, be prepared because of where you are. Second, because of who he is. Keep watch because of who he is. Our Lord Jesus will come in glory. But he has already come to a broken, messed up world to bring light and salvation, to bring hope and comfort. Everywhere he went, there was joy and celebration. You see it at his birth. A chorus of heavenly angels heralded his arrival. Kings traveled miles. These wise men, these magi traveled for miles to bring gifts to this, to this child. Jesus redefined glory. He came humbly as an infant in a feeding trough for animals. He grew up in wisdom and stature before God and before man. He came in power and defeated Satan and his temptations with the word of God. He beat back sin. He forgave sin. He pushed sorrow away. He preached good news to the poor. He cast out demons, people who were afflicted and oppressed. He healed the sick, raised the dead, confronted the hypocrites, the religious, pious, falsely religious and pious people of his day. And finally, he came to save us from our real enemy. And it's not meteor showers and asteroid fields. fields. Our real enemy is sin. He came to forgive that by his death on the cross. He did that for you. And then he rose again to give you hope of eternal life. He ascended into heaven. And he, before he left, he promised he was coming back, though. He was going to come back, and our king is going to come back in glory to judge both the living and the dead, and that is going to be a joyous celebration for us who believe in Jesus. A joyous celebration celebration. One of my favorite things to do is to come home after a day of work and see the faces of my children. It is the best. Like I'll come pull up into my driveway, the door, the garage door will open and my kids will come rushing out and meet me in the threshold and they jump into my arms and they're like, daddy's home. And I pick them up and I swing them around and it's just like you know the face, right? You know the look in the face of a kid when dad comes home or mom comes home. There's so much joy, you know, the fulfillment of hope and anticipation. Imagine that. Take that, bottle that feeling up in a little child. Multiply it times a kajillion. Mix it with wonder and a godly fear and a kind of terror, except this terror makes you happy. That's what it's going to be like when our king comes back to restore all things. It's going to be like that. And imagine who we are and where we are, and it'd be completely transformed into something so indescribably beautiful and good that it just makes you cry. That's, gonna, that's what it's going to be like when the Savior of the nations comes again to restore all things. So I have it on good authority that if you haven't been watching, start watching now. Keep watch. Jesus is coming. Keep watch because of where you are and because of who he is. And you can join me as we pray. Come, Lord Jesus. Quickly come. Amen. I invite the congregation now to stand as we confess our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. We confess. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under the Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From men
You may be seated as we continue our worship with gathering our tithes and our offerings, giving back to God a portion of all that He has given us to further His mission here in this place. We worship God with our offerings. Please stand for prayer. <clears throat> Stir up your power, O Lord, to rescue us from the dangers of this dark world by the advent of your Son, that we may ever walk in his light and learn the way of peace. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Gracious Lord, though we do not know the day or hour of your Son's appearing, Grant that we would always be prepared by sending us faithful pastors and teachers who will boldly proclaim your word of law and gospel, that we may constantly be encouraged and built up in the faith. Lord, in your mercy. O God of Jacob, you have established your kingdom as a beacon to call all nations unto yourself. Teach us to walk in the light of your peace. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord of love, visit our homes and defend us from the temptation to walk in the works of darkness, that husbands and wives may love one another and raise their children in faith. We pray for all who are single or widowed in each calling of life, Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Almighty Lord, you are the authority to whom all temporal authorities must bow. Give wisdom and godly insight to our president our governor, and all who make, administer, or judge laws. Grant peace among the nations, that swords may be truly be beaten into plowshares and spears to pruning hooks. Lord, in your mercy. Compassionate Lord, look with mercy upon the sick. Visit them during these Advent days to comfort with your saving gospel. And as it is your will and your timing to grant healing and peace, Especially, we lift up before you Marla Broughton, Roberta Davis, Mary Ann Fuller, Beth Jones, Patrice Maurer, Cindy McDonald, and Dale Soderstrom. Lord, in your mercy. O oh, loving Father, you alone know the day and the hour when our Lord Jesus will come again in glory. Keep us steadfast in the one true faith that we may ever be ready for his reappearing. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Lord, our, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. O oh Lord, we do thank you for this day, and we pray as you've taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give to you his peace. Thank you.